I'm about as real as they come. All my beats tailored by Joe. Digital. Maserati Rick in Detroit, Deep. convertible bird in Miami, Miami Graduated summa cum laude, strip club made a tsunami Carlton Hines with the ball game, Rayful Edmonds with the snowflakes Craig Pettis in the M-Town, Sal Magluta with the boat game Falcone with the cocaine, like Freeway Ricky with the plug game Like Monster Cody in South Central, Larry Davis from Close Range Yo, yo, we back, it's your boy Pop a lot Mob ties. We on our way to Jamaica with it. Kingston. Then we gonna head to Brooklyn and get some money. Everybody from Jamaica, Kingston, Brooklyn, Flatbush, y'all get in the comment box. This is gonna be epic. Now today we are gonna be covering a guy by the name of Delroy Uzi. Edwards. Now, a little bit about Mr. Edwards. He's just going to be one of the main characters that introduced crack cocaine to Brooklyn. Now, in the midst of doing this episode, it kind of got me to spark a debate. Now, on my research, I read that in 1985, it was safe to say and describe crack as confined to three cities, New York, Los Angeles, and Miami. Now, anybody that was around in the streets in a game at that time, we're on a mission to investigate where did crack come from? Okay, so from what I researched, what I was told, I was told that it was it started in Jamaica, um, a lot of, well, they was calling it freebasing. I also heard that it did start in Miami. So anybody with any common knowledge, the, usually when we start subjects like this, people always like, oh, the government bought it in. Uh, we know the government bought in cocaine, but who was the Albert Einstein that turned it into crack and turned it to a multi-million dollar business for niggas in the ghetto? And all of that. So anybody with any fucking history of that, y'all get in the comment box. That shit always fucking baffles me. But according to the government, Delroy Uzi Edwards is going to be one of the main characters that brought the drug to Brooklyn, specifically the Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. And you can't talk about Delroy Uzi Edwards without talking about his Jamaican roots. Anybody that knows Jamaica know it's split into two parties. It's going to be the JLP and it's going to be the PNP. Uzi Edwards was aligned with the JLP faction. And based on my research and according to a lot of news outlets, Edwards was a killing machine while he was in Jamaica working alongside that JLP faction. It was said that by 1980, Edwards, then 21 years old, was employed as a $10 a week pro JLP gunman. It was said that he was implicated in several killings in the pre-election violence that year. And during the post-election crackdown that they had on a lot of criminals and a lot of the shit that was going on before the election, he then fled to Brooklyn. There's no definite dates or anything of when he got into the country because he was here illegally. But by all accounts, it was right around 1980, 1981. They say he set up shop selling weed out of $5 bags in the back of his father's grocery store on Rogers Avenue, which is located in the Flatbush section of Brooklyn. Now, after leaving Jamaica and all the violence and the chaos that was going there, it seemed like it followed him because his father ended up being murdered in 1982. And Uzi took over the store and expanded the ganja business. And he would eventually get knocked for a gun possession charge that he would end up having to do time for. Now, after his release, they say he would come home and he would round up his gang, some of the people from Jamaica, some new recruits from New York, some people he met from jail. And this is where the story starts to vary a little bit because I saw that the gang, some people called them the Southies, some people called them the Yardies, some people called them the Rankers, 
And I also even seen places where they were calling them the shower posse. But in 1985 was really when shit started jumping off because by all accounts, everybody knows that's when crack really started hitting the fan. And they said he was he set up shop pretty much in Crown Heights. And he also set up shop in Bedford Stuyvesant. Those were two strongholds that they had at first, but they would get a lot of uh, competition and a lot of drama from the African-American gangs that already had spots established in that area. And it wasn't before long that they said he continued the feud with some of the factions that he had from Jamaica with some of the people that came over to New York. I read on one account where he sent one of his associates to a specific street corner in Bedford Stuyvesant where people were known to frequently hustle. And he said, shoot anybody that looks Jamaican. And it just happened to be a reggae artist that was walking up the street and he was shot and paralyzed for life due to that. Some sources I read that when crack was first introduced, the Jamaican gangs would control up to 40% of the business along the East Coast market. And from what I read by all accounts, Delroy Uzi Edwards' reign was vicious. If they even suspected you from skimming a bag or skimming profits, you were getting beat with a baseball bat and getting boiling water thrown on you. So, like I said, in 1985 is where it went down because according to the 30s, that's when Uzi Edwards learned to make crack. And soon he was selling nothing else except for that. He ended up putting the weed down, recognizing that the profit in the crack game was like none other at that time. Like we said earlier, he would have the two spots that were set up in Brooklyn. And police said that he made so much money from that that he was able to pay $150,000 in cash. And this was only in tens and $20 bills to buy a house in a suburb of New York called Long Island. But even that wasn't enough for Edwards. He began looking to expand his business. And unfortunately, New York was already overly crowded at that time with aspiring crack dealers. But outside of New York City, however, it was plenty of virgin territory like Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Now, for instance, crack was just beginning to catch on. And a lot of those cities now enterprising local dealers would travel to New York to buy like ounces of cocaine and return back to their cities and convert the cocaine into crack. And then sell his shit for three to four times more the New York Street price. It's said that in the fall of 1986, Edwards traveled to Washington to set up shop. And by the following spring, his lieutenants had established thriving businesses in Philadelphia and in Baltimore. At its peak, the Edwards organization had employed 50 workers and was said to make up to $100,000 a day. Based on my research, it's like with the increase of money, he pretty much increased the violence. And by all accounts, it was business as usual through the rest of 1986, 87. Now, towards 1988 and 89 is where it starts to get real. Um, because like y'all know, and like I always say, especially when we covering these gangs, that's when the police start picking up. So I, I remember going at it with somebody in the comment box that said, well, the police always knew what was going on. Yeah. Well, the upper level always knew what was going on, but the beat cops didn't know what was going on. They were seeing people with beepers. They were stopping young black teenagers with large amounts of money. They were just getting hit, but right around then, oh, they eyes was open. And with Delroy Uzi Edwards not being the most so subtle person with the business, the violence is also going to bring the police. So it wouldn't be long, June 1989, to be exact, where Brooklyn jury would find Uzi Edwards guilty of murder and drug racketeering. And at his trial, people as close as him as the second in command, a guy by the name of Keith 
Bud Manning testified and described to the jury about how Uzi Edwards ordered killings and ordered beatings. Prosecutors would go on to say how Edwards made mountains of money after introducing crack, the powerful cocaine-based drug, to poor neighborhoods in Brooklyn in 1985. He was accused of six murders, more than a dozen assaults, racketeering, kidnapping, drug conspiracy, and would end up being sentenced to more than seven life sentences and is currently locked up serving time today. So a lot of people would consider him one of the original dons or top shotters and one of the people that introduced the Jamaican posses to the United States. So this is a story like no other and it had to be told. Y'all make sure y'all follow me on Twitter, on Instagram, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. Y'all get in the comment box, drop them requests. Y'all at me on both those networks. Send them requests through. I'm going to be back with some more real trail spill shit. Y'all hit that bell for them notifications. And y'all know what it is. It's the mob. Mob, 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 ties.